Welcome to the second hour of the Situation Room. This is Kenya's biggest conversation broadcasting on www.spicefm.co.ke as well as Spice FM KE, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. And we are in Malindi 97.7, Nyeri 90.9, Eldoret 96.7, 96.0 oh in Nakuru, Kisumu 102.5, Mombasa 87.9 and 94.4 in Nairobi. Let's talk COVID-19 and the battle against COVID-19 by all Kenyans. We'll be talking to somebody who has uh, tested positive and has been battling COVID-19 through home-based care. But before we, as we do that as well, let's look at what the government has been doing. So we have raised the issue of our testing capacity in the country for quite a while. So far, since the beginning, we have only tested 335,000 318 samples so far but uh, we are seeing also the government revising its protocols on testing for instance previously you required to go undergo two negative consecutive negative tests within 24 hours mm -hmm. for you to be declared covid free and now if even from a cdc's advisory the government through health director general patrick amoth have uh, discharged new protocols which rule out the need for a second test for patients whose symptoms have cleared. So once you've cleared, your symptoms have cleared, and you're seeing that uh, this is uh, around page 8 of the standard, and there's, there's, there's clear indication that really your um, symptoms that were there uh, have cleared, and you've even tested, screening has just shown that you have you don't have a high temperature anymore. You're basically just clear to go home. Mm -hmm. No need for us to... Uh, do another test on you but it also raises the other issue and these are the complaints that have been coming from the counties the length and the amount of time it takes before you receive your results mm -hmm. and what that means in the fight against covid for instance yesterday the nakuru county through governor lee kenyanjui was raising the concern saying the delay is increasingly putting patients and their contacts in danger for example we are yet to receive results of 309 samples taken to Camry Lab on July 28, 2020. Such a delay could lead to further spread of the disease. 28th July, samples taken, taken to Camry Lab by yesterday, the 6th of August, results haven't come yet. Mm -hmm. And those people are not somewhere confined or quarantined. Some of them are in, are in hospital, others have been discharged to go back home, and contact tracing has not even commenced because we don't know how many people have tested positive. We'll talk to Charity Tsei, who is an active citizen, um, a regular on this show. She has been our guest host a couple of times. Charity went out to uh, publicly and said, you know what, guys, I tested positive for COVID-19. I am, um, you know, treating myself through home-based care at home. I, it has been a number of days. And then at the end of the 14 days, of course, she took another test to find out whether there's she still has the symptoms, waited a couple of days, results came back, still positive. So we let's hear the experience that Chero has gone through. But also, uh, as we raise the issue of uh, tests, the, how long it's taking to test, and this all home-based care and what it means. Chero, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, good morning. Chero. How are you? We're well. We are well. And it's good to hear yeah. you this morning. You sound um, energetic. Not as you usually do, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost there. You're almost getting back there. Yes, yes, yes. How many days since you tested positive? Uh, this is my 25th day in, in... Well, this is my 25th day in total since I started uh, to self-quarantine. Uh, and it is about uh, 15 days 15 16 days since i tested positive i tested positive on the 22nd of july mm. but i first went into self-quarantine on the 14th of july and today is the 7th of august mm. so, so 25 days in total that mm. i've been in in quarantine in isolation mm. so from the 14th to the 22nd when you tested positive those are eight days explain yes. this gap what I was doing, because uh, Monday the 13th of July, 
I felt like I was catching a cold. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have children in the household, it's very possible to pick up a homa from them and that type of thing. So you first of all want to eliminate and rule out um, the usual. And uh, I went to bed that night on the 13th. And I last caught malaria when I was 10 years old, I think, which is a, which is 100 years ago, if you think about it. <laughs> and I, But I felt this. The, the, the feelings of, of malaria, the, mm. the, the pain, the aches, and I was, and then I started uh, shaking, I had the chills, I was hot, but I still went to bed as usual. But in the morning, I banished um, everyone mm. who ever comes into my room from my room, mm. um, including the dear husband, and I immediately created a cordon because in the morning I realized mm. this is something different than usual, mm -hmm. and I have never felt as I have felt these, the, the first 14, 15 days of, of my illness. Mm -hmm. So I took that week, which was a terrible week. If you want to hear about the symptoms later or now, I can share them with you. But it was a very difficult week. The exhaustion, um, you can't even wake up. You can't shower. You Going to the bathroom is, is, the, is a major effort. You are, you just, you're wiped out. And, you know, there are people who have varying degrees of symptoms mm -hmm. and many are completely asymptomatic. I think I had a pretty heavy set of symptoms, but not enough to land me in hospital mm -hmm. because I was breathing okay. But I learned something later on from my physician about something called happy hypoxia, hy happy hypoxia. Hypoxemia, I mm -hmm. believe, mm -hmm. which means that you don't have the symptoms of somebody who is struggling to breathe, but your oxygen levels are dropping rapidly. And you don't know. You're mm -hmm. just there. You think you're just sick. So who knows? Because I did not have an oximeter at home. Yeah. So I spent the first week trying to take care of myself, completely isolated. We went straight into COVID protocols in the house, even before I knew I was positive for covid but mostly paracetamol, honey, lemon, ginger, and I was wiped out. Mm -hmm. I was just sleeping. When people would call me, I could barely, I just stopped taking the phone. Mm -hmm. Sending a text was a, big, was, was a big, big headache for me because I couldn't even get my brain to focus on texting and so on and so forth. So after uh, day number six, seven, then I said I need to go for a test. And that mm -hmm. is when I now set up the process for applying for an appointment to go for a test. Mm -hmm. And I had my test done at the very impeccable labs of the International Organization for Migration, IOM. Mm -hmm. um, it is a service that I think is currently extended to the INGOs, the diplomatic community, the UN, and so on. Mm -hmm. But I'm a former staff member of the IOM, so they extended the courtesy to me. Mm -hmm. And I went in uh, for a test. And the good thing with their test is you get the results within a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. okay. So when I went in on the 22nd of July, um, I had my test done. And by the afternoon, I got the call from the psychosocial counselor and uh, the emailed test results that I had COVID. Mm -hmm. And that is now when I went into the into treatment protocols. I called my physician who had referred me for the test, and um, and then you know she prescribed a set of medication uh, for me, and that is what I have been taking as well as rest as well as the continued uh, protocols of isolation. Um, I speak to my family regularly. Uh, mm -hmm. They even can stand at the door because it's a distance. And I can say, how are you doing? And they can uh, drop food and drink um, mm -hmm. at the door. Or if I have myself to go to the kitchen, I do it late at night when there's nobody around and my hands are washed and I'm wearing a mask and all the protocols. So that's what I've been doing. And this mm. is the 25th day. I can say by the second and a half week of illness, I started to turn the corner and I started to feel much better. And mm -hmm. today I will put myself at 85 to 90% recovered. It, um, Chero, if you were to go through it in your mind, um, yes. would it ever have connected with you where you would have, whom you may have come in contact with, or how you may have contracted COVID? Did it ever cross your mind? Do that's a good question because uh, the first thing that happens, and mm -hmm. what the IOM clinic and all other labs and clinics that take our samples do is they have to report back to MOH mm -hmm. at the end of the day and say we tested X number of people, these were uh, positive, these are negative, and some I even hear there's an indeterminate result. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And um, so they report that back. So when that happened, and uh, having spoken with some friends who have uh, had COVID, I expected within the next three, four days, um, some kind of random call from Ministry of Health. I did not expect Ministry of Health to come to my house and, <laughs> and check. No, no, none of that, because I know they're busy, they're overwhelmed, they're mm-hmm. not coping with the numbers. But uh, this is day number 25, and I have never received a single call from MOH. So I went into home-based care on my own Mm. using protocols that I had read from Ministry of Health and WHO. And within the parameters and the capacities of the house where I live, I was able now to create a system within that framework. I also then did my own contact tracing. And I started thinking back, who have I been with? Who Mm. was I with? Especially the week leading up to my feeling sick. So if I started to feel sick the night of the 13th, the week before, where was I? Mm. So I worked my way through the whole list. I called those who I felt I may have been in contact with, but nothing I was doing was different than the usual routine. And it often means that I am am Mm home-based. But on Sabbath Sabbath, We had uh, comrades who were arrested, if you remember uh, correctly, who were trying to demonstrate. And um, I had a a Zoom event um, all day, but at about 5 p.m., I went down to Central Police Station, observed all the usual protocols, masks, etc., social distance, and I was there with other comrades until about 8 p.m. when everyone was released. Mm -hmm. So that, you could say, would have been the only off-the-beaten-path uh, um, place I went to because that's not where I usually am, thank yes. God. Um, but but um, but that was it. But I, I, when I spoke to those I was with at Central, I think everybody is okay. Mm-hmm. So you cannot tell where you pick this thing up. Mm-hmm. Was it in the supermarket? Mm-hmm. Was it a random? Who knows? Because these aerosolized droplets hang and float in the air. They don't drop to the ground immediately because they are so microscopic. They are so small. They can linger in the air. And this is why one of the things I have learned, even when I interact from afar with my family members, Mm. is masking is critical. Mm. It's absolutely critical. It is those aerosolized droplets in the air. In fact, when I looked at the revised CDC guidelines, they talk about low transmission risk from surfaces, even though you still have to wipe down your surfaces. But imagine Mm. if I sneeze on on, on a surface and you, Eric, came and touched it, you would have to touch it, rub your hands in it, then bring your hands to your face, Mm. maybe rub your eyes, maybe lick your hands. I mean, so so it would really be a lot of exposure to, 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 to the virus on the surface. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't keep our surfaces clean, but there's now new studies emerging as to where it is most easy to contract COVID and it still remains that it's in the air. It's in it the is air. the sneezing, the coughing, the talking, the breathing, with coughing and sneezing being the number one ways to projectile push your 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 droplets if you have COVID out into the air for other people to breathe. But even Especially as you say that, they're Jero, not wearing masks. As, yeah. as you say that also from uh, how you've described your days um, yeah. Of course, there are times when you would leave home to go for, let's say, shopping at the local shops. You'd, oh. you'd um, you know, meet up with somebody, but you'd ensure that you're masked throughout. Yes. But despite all that, it's, despite having the mask throughout, and despite making sure that the people that you are, uh, you know, coming across, even in the supermarket alleys, are either masked or you are keeping a very big distance between you and them, Mm. You still end up getting it, and you don't. You cannot tell where. Exactly. Which, this which, is it is it is ubiquitous. It is with us. It is everywhere. Cheryl, has As it changed? Say, it is becoming endemic. Mm. Has it changed the way you thought of COVID before you got it, and now? Has your attitude you know, changed? Obviously, like if you have been in a road accident, even if you were not the one driving and you didn't cause it, you are forever vigilant whether you're driving or somebody else is driving because you you you're sensitive because you know the impact Mm -hmm. of impact whereas uh, and so i always took COVID seriously even though i have always been against the idea of 
curfews and lockdowns without a plan to mm. cushion uh, the communities. And we spoke about it the last time I was guest hosting. Yeah. I still have never believed that COVID doesn't exist. You know, mm. there are all those people who think this is some conspiracy right. somewhere and we're being fooled and so on. Yes, there are issues with lab results. There's issues with the pace of, of, of testing or in terms of, of results being sent back and that even if people are positive, they have two, three days, as you said, Eric, of continuing to infect others while waiting for, for, for results. For results. But I have become hyper vigilant, mm -hmm. not hysterical. Mm. I'm not a hysterical person. I'm also not a hypochondriac. So I, I make a good case for somebody to have I'm, a, I'm the best of the type of person who could have symptoms because I don't I, I, I didn't lose the plot. I did not become hysterical. I just went into calm emergency response mode mm. and said, right, this is what needs to happen. And I listened very closely to my body, the symptoms how I was feeling, if I remember, because I now have a lot of brain fog. So you may, you may tell me that as we spoke about 30 minutes ago, I will tell you <laughs> what did we speak about. Yeah. It is real. Some of the neurological impacts, I yeah. cannot send a, type a tweet or, or send a text without editing it a hundred times. I will still make mistakes. Um, so, so there's, and my, my physician said, these are some of the many, many protracted effects of, of COVID that wow. we are still learning about mm -hmm. and we're still trying to understand. So uh, to answer your question, do I am hyper vigilant? Mm -hmm. And let me tell anybody who's walking around with the capacity and the means to wear a mask mm -hmm. and they're not wearing a mask. They are A, not protecting themselves and B, they're not protecting others. Because mm -hmm. safety starts with you. Right. And if you don't protect yourself, then how are you going to protect others? Mm -hmm. I know that there are many who cannot afford masks, and for that there has to be a plan to make sure. Because again, with your mask, you can't wear your mask like a jacket, you know, an overcoat mm -hmm. that you can wear for a month and then you clean it. Yep. A mask is something that has to be replaced regularly because you're coughing into it, breathing into it, sneezing into it, so if you wear the same mask and the cheapest mask, then I like them too because they're colorful and they don't give you a sense of you're in hospital and dying. <laughs> are the cloth are the cloth masks? Mm -hmm. Those ones, if you now wear it for a week, two weeks now, Jaosha. Yeah. You're you're like a walking cesspit right. of, of germs. Of germs. And then and then you drop it down to your chin, so you're transferring the germs to your chin. To your face. Mm. So Mm. to your face and then you put it back and and you're often when you have the blue surgical mask you're often pinching the top of it so that it fits properly on your nose so we are constantly touching our faces and touching the mask so those who cannot afford to have a good set of masks that they regularly replace there should be a provision there mm. should be some facilitation mm. masks to be distributed for people to have them for free because that free, the cost of a mask is still less than the cost of treating of treatment. someone mm. who has COVID. But everybody else who can afford yep. their mask, mm. wear your mask. I see people on social media taking photos. They are not wearing masks. The conversation continues with active citizen Charoti Tsei, who is giving us her experience with a battling COVID-19. On the 14th of July, as she tells us, she developed those symptoms and she felt Hey, this is not just the ordinary cold. So she went into the full protocol of, wait, I am going to put myself in quarantine. And this is uh, even distancing herself from her own family. Her children not accessing her. Her husband, who was now uh, moved from the right side of the bed to... <laughs> the floor. The floor. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different, you know, far from... <laughs> yeah. Oh. And this is where this is where now I wasn't aware you were listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, he is listening. Oh dear! I don't know where he is. Oh, you I don't know where he is. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen him for I, twenty-five days. <laughs> uh, no, I. Uh, by the way, you know, mm. I have to really uh, say that these protocols. You know, when you're told uh, you must be absolutely silent in class. Mm -hmm. Every teacher knows that no one will remain absolutely silent, but they give you an extreme parameter so that you do your best to fall yep. as much as possible within the minimum threshold. Mm. And I think that is what these protocols are, because when you look at it, when they say you must change your bedding, wash your things separately, bleach, what, this, nobody has the resources. Yeah. 
to do all of those things. Yeah. But I think the messaging is saying, please keep yourself separate. Mm. So the idea of sequestering yourself as if you're in solitary confinement without talking to anybody, somebody can open the door and say, hello, how are you? Mm. My husband even has a perch on a chair outside the door Mm -hmm. where sometimes he can open the door, a crack, I have my mask on, windows are open, and we can talk. Mm. Because you have to plan the day, you have to discuss different things that need to happen, especially as I started to get better. Mm. So you create protocols that work. But queen gear and to sit on the bed to talk to me, nothing, nothing. Mm. But also, I can imagine uh, the the Mm. toll that this has had on your family. I can imagine in those early days when you're saying that the symptoms were really severe, you were completely tired. They are sitting outside. They're not sure how mommy is doing. This must have been a very, very difficult time for them. I think it was. And, you know, when I appeared on Jeff's show um, last week, Mm. Dr. Frank and Jenga spoke afterwards. And he spoke at length about some of the effects that COVID and and even just staying at home, being generally under home imprisonment, has a negative effect on family. Mm. And if you have the luxury of faith, then if you're confined to the house and if you have the luxury of a backyard, so it will just depend on your space. Uh, parameters and and how you're able to live. So there's that. And then now if you add somebody who has tested positive for COVID and is symptomatic, Mm. even those who are symptomatic have to stay in isolation. Mm. But when you're symptomatic, yes, it brings about stress. Uh, uh, My husband was saying he has never seen me this sick. And as I told you, I'm not a hypochondriac. Mm. I power my way through illnesses. Mm. I usually am the last one. I'm even anti-medication. I try to push till the last possible minute. My doctor had to debate at length with me about every piece of medication that uh, she gave me because I was like, what is this for? And why am I? And here I am dying. I'm <laughs> sick. <laughs> and I'm still questioning why I'm being given this medication and what it is meant for. So, so my family, yes, have been quite worried. I have two older teenagers on their way out of high school mm. and I have a two-year-old. Mm. And uh, and uh, I think the older ones were a bit happy that mom is not on their case every <laughs> single day to see what time they woke up, what they are doing, how they are keeping themselves busy. Mm. But they were extremely instrumental. They continue to be bring me up my water, bring me up my food, check on me. So because I allowed some level of dialogue and contact, yeah. even when I was wiped out in bed and couldn't move, I think that alleviated their sense of concern. And as they have seen me improve from week to week, um, uh, then I think it has improved. But I cannot underestimate the stress it has. My mother, who is in her 70s, uh, my father, who is almost 80, Mm. well, my father didn't suggest it, but my mother had said, should I come to Nairobi? (laughs) I told her, I told her, are you you crazy? (laughs) You're you're at extremely high risk. You're not coming to that. So people kick into that mode of what are we going to do? How can we help you? Mm. Because you can't do the usual visiting someone. When someone is sick, you visit them. Right. You can't visit you can't visit people when they have COVID. Mm. You can't even go to hospital. I've heard this terrible stories yeah. of families who have lost loved ones but they could not even be by their side mm. yeah. when they were when they were in hospital and at the time that they passed on. So I consider myself I also have an attitude of gratitude because I could have died if mm. you think about it that way. I was quite symptomatic but somehow and i don't know why i don't have a comorbidity that could be one of the things Mm. i don't have high blood pressure or diabetes or asthma some of those things that they say could tend to complicate uh your recovery Mm. but i'm not saying that everyone who has passed away had a comorbidity in fact it could be a case of the happy hypoxia i was telling you about you're you're not so bad and your oxygen levels drop and drop that's why sometimes you see photos of somebody has just died by their taxi or somebody has just dropped dead somewhere maybe their oxygen levels dropped to the point and they didn't realize and they just thought oh i just have a homa so i'm so grateful mm. that I am still here. I have read about long COVID and the fact that uh, sometimes people like me, because my physician said it's not normal after 22 days of symptoms to mm. still test 
positive mm. for COVID. And he said, you know, it happens with quite a number of cases, but it's not normal. Usually by 10 days, by 14 days, it has cleared and you're able to go back to the real world. And mm. let me underscore, I'm not a medic. This is experiential. I'm just sharing my experiences as somebody who is positive for COVID. So none of my advice should be seen as medical advice because I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a medic. I'm not a public health specialist and I'm not a medical doctor. So I can just share what my physicians have said and what I have experienced. You know, teacher, someone who is now in that unique position of being genuinely empathetic to people who may contact the COVID virus, I want you to just sort of like, if I may, uh, shift your mind to those who don't have the luxury of space and are confronted with the ailment caused by COVID. What do we do to ensure that these people actually stay well? I'm talking about people, for instance, we live in Nairobi, people who live in the areas we refer to as slums mm. Mm. or people who live in places that we call low rent who on honestly don't have this luxury of space. What do you do with such people? I know it's a difficult question I'm asking, but I'd like your thoughts on it. It is, thanks. It's, it's not even a difficult question because I have been thinking about this, advocating around and about this since the very beginning when COVID was declared an emergency in Kenya. I went about it, the cash transfer route, so that families that are already suffering do not drift further into penury and mm. also have the wherewithal in the face of loss of income, in the face of loss of livelihoods, to be able to support themselves and their families. But when I have gone to underserved communities, slums as they are sometimes called, or densely populated areas, because of the humanity Kenya work I'm doing, I have come to see and I already knew it because I'm not a visitor, I'm not a stranger in Jerusalem. I have come to understand even more clearly that it is impossible <coughs> excuse me, to quarantine at home. Mm. It is impossible to isolate when you have two rooms in your house or one room in your house. If I lived in a 15 by 10 room in Korogocho, and I tested positive for COVID. What are the protocols, really, seriously speaking, that my family can put in place? Number one, I'm the maybe sole breadwinner. Yep. And as somebody who has been a single mom for many years, I understand those dynamics. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if I was a sole breadwinner, I have tested positive for COVID. Let's use my three children that I have now. Mm. I have three children. What, what do I do? Hmm. How do I sequester myself in the house? How do I stop my trading if I'm selling vegetables or if I have some other biashara? Yep. How do I stop all of that? Right. How do I isolate myself in my house? How do I use the public ablution? How am I able to take, to afford the medicine that will be prescribed to me? the antibiotics or anything. And then all these fancy schmancy remedies. Everyone is always saying, use this, use that. I have been, I have been on the receiving end of a vast number mm. of crazy sounding remedies, which <laughs> work. Um, I thank and God bless all of those who send me their suggestions. Yeah. But most of these remedies are out of the reach of the ordinary Wanainchi. Mm -hmm. If you're being told to look for things that are only found at in healthy you, mm. who is going to healthy you to spend 2,000 bob on some supplement somewhere or some powder somewhere? Yeah. You know, so I am so sensitive, CT, to the fact that home-based care is the privilege and the luxury of very few. Mm. I'm equally cognizant of the fact that despite efforts, never mind the pervasive corruption that has gone into overdrive and high drive during COVID. Uh, but I am also aware of the fact that MOH is overwhelmed. Mm. So much as I say, they never called me. I also understand if you don't have the personnel, if you're not able to keep up with everything that's happening in the country, why are you going to call me? In fact, you will say, phew, that this, one is taking one, care of yeah, yeah. That That one is fine. But now back to what CT was saying, what are we doing? What would I do? Do you know what I would do? Mm -hmm. I would not announce my COVID results to anybody. Yep. I would kazana. Hmm. I would find my morobaini somewhere. I would drink it. Yep. I would wear a mask. I would try to keep a bit separate from the kids and they would not know why I'm not being so close to them. Yeah. But I would get 
on with life, with life and say god help us all because i cannot afford to be sick i cannot afford to lie in bed i have to feed my children we have to survive and the day kenyans understand that support medical support is not the privilege of a few but it is the right of all mm. then we will wake up and understand that this home-based care thing as a way of passing the buck to the individual mm. is not sustainable and the community spread will be like wildfire kabisa we will not be able to stop it and i will never blame even for a second somebody who was in the hypothetical situation that i just described mm. for opting not to share her status with anybody mm on fight against covid-19 especially now when you have brought in the conversation on home based care and the home based care protocols city uh, well my follow up question is i wanted to ask jerotish uh, you know there's a lot of the talk around covid has to do with treatment mm -hmm. now what about prevention again i want your thoughts on this okay well prevention one of the things my uh, doctors the two who have been taking very good care of me via telemedicine although i had a home based uh, visit yesterday for the first time mm. um so that's another thing you can actually consult without going to a clinic mm. um and so on and so forth but one of the things they have both told me is that everybody at one point or another will catch covid this is not something that will be eradicated you know the way smallpox was eradicated mm. the way we say kick out polio you know the, this is something that will be with us i think what is the most important thing is to stave off its landing on you for as long as possible mm -hmm. while the virus has an opportunity to work its way to other less fortunate members of the of the society who manage to catch it and more or less filter it or soften it or allow it to become something mm. that you can survive mm. so i believe that in the interim what everybody must do mm. is keep themselves and the other safe you know people talk about good nutrition supplements build your immunity i really try to avoid that because it Why? is again the luxury of very few so yes those who can afford a balanced diet three times a day who can afford honey lemon juice garlic what vitamin c zinc ginger all of those who can yes do it go for it make your boil your concoctions feed it to your children make sure they drink it your cod liver oil your colloidal silver your this your that there is so much out there but i am sensitive to the fact that we are going to soon turn the prevention of covid into an elite exercise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is 100% dependent on the resources you have yeah and the rest of you who don't have money god help you and we're not actually talking about you because we know anyway you can't afford it mm. so if i go somewhere in kayole and we start talking about how to prevent covid and i start describing honey lemon ginger see people will do control out delete right. immediately they'll say this person is outside the realms they don't understand our context and our reality and that's why it goes back to the one thing i keep talking about you need to cushion families i was even thinking to myself families that test covid positive who require assistance mm -hmm. and facilitation for home based care should receive a grant mm. an unconditional grant that will facilitate for example lost income so if i was working the same let's use myself as a single mom with three kids somewhere in 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 one of the understaffed uh, communities or the informal settlements or slums mm. and i have lost my job and i was cleaning somewhere or i was doing this or that or the other i need a grant that will allow me to stay home and recover because it has replaced at least a nominal amount of my lost income and has allowed me to still take care of my family if you don't support families practically in a humanitarian manner mm. and with dignity and offer unconditional cash and i will be singing the and preaching the gospel of cash transfers until kingdom come you will not be able to prevent the rapid spread of covid people will catch it we will all catch it eventually but, but also how about the issue of isolation facilities Ichiro? because um the isolation facilities are not enough 
yeah, this whole yeah. idea of home based care like you said so somebody tests positive and they still need to stay here um with their family and possibly because of the proximity of living quarters they are likely going to infect their family members mm. they they will i mean and and that is the inevitability if i had a house the size of my medium bedroom mm. as you would know in an apartment or a townhouse the size of a bedroom yep. if we were all living in equivalent to one bedroom mm -hmm. of course i would spread it by now my kids would have it my husband would have it and anybody else who comes to see me it is inevitable so i find it ludicrous when people say we are now reverting to home-based care moreover a home-based care that is not based or predicated upon a very solid foundation yeah. of outreach and visits to people and facilitation for example if someone tests positive i don't know maybe ministry of health can correct us later on do they go home with a pack of masks of sanitizer of some basic equipment do they say we shall give you your round of drugs free of charge no or do they say home base goodbye. sort yourself out and then now, what is Talk, and we'll talk, talk to you later. We that we, then we say that it's alcohol spreading, um, spreading COVID. <laughs> it's community spread now, and most people. Which is why I'm, ra I'm raising that are issue. Not it in bars. Which is why I'm raising the issue and saying uh, because whereas we support home based care for those that are able to, then there are others that we should be clear that you see home based care will not work in very many other cases, and that's why you need the isolation facilities. Yes. We still have. I mean, I, when we had quarantine, we had the quarantine facilities. Schools are still closed. Mm -hmm. We have the benefit you know of the, having boarding the, schools closed in the country. I, I wrote about this in an op-ed in March where I said, and I have worked in emergency humanitarian response for many years, mm. and maybe this is why I'm calm <clears throat> excuse me, in the face of an emergency because that's not the moment to panic. But mm. one of the things, and anybody who is an emergency response specialist will tell you, there are protocols that you put in place. I even proposed in that op-ed in, in March, I said you can have rub holes. If you don't want to use primary schools and so on because of maybe aspects of, of, of fumigation or restoration afterwards, you have these military-style rub holes, mm. big tents that can be set up in certain parts in community fields um if they are if they haven't all been grabbed in different locations of the city so you zone the city yeah. and you have one for the south for the north for the east you can put five six hundred beds in isolation so you have the space and you have medical staff who would be able mm. to take care of the staff of the of the patients in isolation so then i would have the responsibility for example of saying to my neighbor tafadhali chunga watoto wangu mm. if i have a relative who i can call to come and stay with my kids for the next uh, 10 days yeah. and i go to that facility and i check myself in or, or i or i get admitted and i have a bed and i have care for the next 14 days or 10 days mm -hmm. until my symptoms or if i'm asymptomatic or until i am deemed no longer infectious and then i'm released back to the community General, so i'm a bit worried i'm sorry I'm just to 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 and then i'm a oh. bit worried i mean i'm just listening to you now and i can i'm hearing what you were able to do and stay at home and i think it was interesting because earlier you mentioned that not a call not anything from the ministry of health and we know for a fact that this information is sent to them in terms of who then is tested positive but then i am worried about so many other people then who have been released into this home-based care right um, yeah. And then if there would be anything that they need in terms of information, which for whatever reason they're not able to get on their own, then they're not getting it. They're not. Hmm. Look at the cost. Let's now do back of the envelope math. Hmm. Um, because we're talking about the social cost, the emotional cost, etc. My test which I understood is now actually quite an affordable um, because it costs $60 compared mm. to other labs that, co that charge 
eighty dollars, ninety dollars, a hundred dollars. I've heard of people paying ten thousand bob for a test. Mm. But then, if you go to Kenyatta for your test or any other um, a, a public facility, you have to be symptomatic before somebody will take the time to use their limited resources to test you. Right. So if you go privately or you have an organization or a company that can pay for your test, you will go to the usual Lancet, the usual. But I went to the IOM clinic that cost $60. I've done two tests. Mm. Actually, my husband has also taken two tests to be sure, and both times he has come back negative. Mm. And one of the people who helped me at home also went for a test and tested negative. Mm. So count that. 6,500 times two for me, yep. that's 13K. Mm. 6,500 times two for my husband, that's now 26K in yep. total. And then one staff member, that is 33K that we have spent, 32, five mm. that we have spent. On, on tests test. alone. Yes. My mm. drugs, my medication has come to about 12, 13,000 shillings so far. Mm. Mm. And then you have doctor's consultations. Because this is not for free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know insurance companies have ditched us. Yeah. Mm. So that comes to another anywhere between uh, 15 and 30K. Okay? Yeah. And then you have the cost of the so-called specialized additionals. So if your family is not in the habit of having, which my family is, but still the volume had to be increased, the bulk had to be increased of ginger, of honey, of lemon and everything. Mm. And then separate food or, or whatever you ask for. Although I must say with my loss of sense of smell or taste, and all of that, you don't even want to eat. You lose. Your, you have to be forced and reminded to eat because you really don't want to eat. Mm. But look at the cost of your supplements, your zinc, your multivitamins, mm-hmm. everything that everyone is telling you to take. They are giving you this long range of healthy you yeah. available supplements, which will cost money. Then the hidden cost, rent, utility, the fact that I have airtime or bundles or Wi-Fi, mm. electric, uh, water, because if you don't have those basic utilities, if you don't have indoor ablution, the neighborhood will not let you go and use the communal uh, um, facilities. Uh, bathroom yeah. Because right. they think that COVID is like Ebola, mm. or they think that it is like leprosy, or it's as shameful as, as syphilis or whatever it is. Mm. So it is, it, is, it is very expensive to do your home-based care. By the time I come out, minus the, 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 the running costs of rent and so on and so forth, you can be at, at tens of thousands of shillings. Who has that money? I can tell you for free, with my business having shut down because of COVID, because I'm in the hospitality business, mm. and I'm not back up to speed, And I'm a consultant, a humanitarian and development consultant, and my work was regional, who's traveling and flying around the region. You can also understand that my income base has been vastly depleted. True. So every single shilling I'm spending on COVID treatment, home-based, actually I've been released into home-based care, Mm. is money that was meant for something else. Mm. And if push comes to shove, If I had to make a decision between buying my medication and making sure that my kids have something to eat, you can be sure what I would choose. Yeah, the choice is pretty obvious. Mm. Basically, what it sounds like is home-based care is just as expensive. Well, not just as expensive, let's be fair. It's still expensive. But, um, well, it's not as expensive as if you were in a hospital because in a hospital, then you'd be paying for all those PPEs Mm. that everybody would be wearing just to, to attend to you. We have only removed that cost, but all the other associated costs are still there. I mean, it's still expensive to treat COVID-19 wherever you are, at home, in the hospital, wherever. It'll still cost you. If I, the question I want to ask is, is it expensive to treat COVID or has it been made expensive? It has been made expensive, CT. If you look at now, mm. uh, what we have spent, the replication and the duplication of cost of PPE is because mm. of the corruption. Yep. Jack Ma's donations disappearing in action. If you look at how much it has cost, ostensibly, the government to procure the equipment, the drugs, the testing, every single element of procurement, of, of, of support for COVID yeah. is riddled with some kind of irregularity mm. and there's some kind of corruption. So why it is expensive is the opportunity cost of corruption has been landed on the taxpayer. 
So we are looking at treating someone in hospital to the tunes of tens of hundreds of thousands, even some people who ended up in ICU, mm. why in the millions? Yep. Why should it cost that much? Never mind the issue that private hospitals and th- what they charge, this is just immoral. That's a story for another day. Yeah. So at the end of the day, CT, it w- should not cost that much to treat someone who has COVID. But people have come in, politically connected individuals, to capitalize and maximize on the money that seems to be flowing from an open tap to help Kenya deal with COVID. Mm. This is the last circle of Dante's Inferno. Mm. It is the worst form of criminality. I thought that Kenya had sunk, and you know me in the energy sector, Mm. including every single thing that happens, how they steal from consumers. I thought we couldn't sink any lower. And look at what we are doing. We've proved you wrong, haven't we? (laughs) I mean, is there another circle of hell? I suspect that being Kenyan, yes. Oh, yes, there is. I'm sure we'll come across Mm. one. Just when you think you've reached the nth, something else will come up which will make you ponder and say, why on earth did I think we'd reached the end of this? Hmm. And the cost gets keeps getting worse. You see, the, the worst part of it is those in government... If they fall sick, or let's say when they fall sick, because we expect that people are going to fall sick. When they fall sick, they get treated. All these costs are basically our costs. It's not their cost. Yeah. So they don't feel the pinch. They don't feel the pinch of, okay, so it's, it, I, I was in hospital. I was in ICU for four days. I moved from ICU to HDU. I stayed in general ward. I still tested positive. 25 days down the road is when I was released. They don't think about how much it costs. But in reality, it costs all in the, to the tune of millions, which we as a taxpayer paid. And an ordinary person goes and gets admitted for the same over the same duration of time and no one to pay for them. And we still keep talking about we have a government, we have a state that is uh, socially active and aware of the citizens. Madness, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and you know, I wish every single Kenyan understood Mm. that the money that is being stolen with impunity is our money. And if there was anything I could ever tell Kenyans, if there was somebody who wanted to run for leadership in this country, Mm -hmm. they should have three agendas only. Mm -hmm. Agenda number one, corruption. Mm -hmm. Agenda number two, corruption. Agenda number three, corruption. Corruption. And agenda one, investigate thoroughly. Hmm. Agenda number two, prosecute. Agenda number three, incarcerate, restitute. We want our money back. Let me tell you, there is nothing that will prosper in this country. Even when I'm looking at the county revenue allocation debates ongoing, Mm. you can debate until you find something equitable and then the money is stolen. You can do anything you want to do. You can receive billions of shillings from IMF. You can go for as many euro bonds as you like. You can receive bilateral, multilateral grants. You can do whatever you want to do. But so long as the architecture and the fabric of corruption has not been dealt with in Kenya conclusively, including the laws of lustration, which mean that anybody that is found having stolen public funds on any level, misappropriated, has a pending case. Once they have done their restitution and they have returned what they stole or they have been incarcerated, Mm. they can never run again for public office. Can you imagine what type of handful of people you'll have left now Mm. willing to stand for public office? So, my friends, we are are what I call spitting in the wind. So long as we have not conclusively dealt 
with corruption. And it seems so ubiquitous. Corruption, corruption, just like cartels. Everyone says cartels, cartels. And everyone says accountability, accountability. It is also part of the strategy to numb us into a sense of, of disbelief that it is not possible to stamp out corruption. Corruption in this in country. So, I mean, Shira, as we look at this and more and more people are getting to the point whereby, you know, like you said, and I think it was very poignant, as you say, that a lot of people are going to make the decision then to stay with it as sick as they may get, because the other option on the other side is not anything that they would be able to afford, whether financially or socially, when it comes to taking care of families. Um, aren't we going to get to the point whereby a lot of people then would literally carry this illness as opposed to spending money and then hope they get better? Yes, yes. And this is how community spread is happening. It's a combination of people not wearing by choice or even by, by, by design. They just don't default. They don't have the money. Uh, not wearing masks, not having the ability to socially distance. So we're being told socially distance, but you can't. So there's all of that. It's going to spread. It's going to be, it's going to be every single place that you look. Mm -hmm. And instead of the government looking at how to cushion and protect and and uh, and ensure that communities because you cannot eradicate slums in two months as to make people ready for covid mm. slums are public policy failures and have been with us for decades and you cannot build that room in a day it will require a systematic rethinking of urban planning Mm. and cushioning of the population in a different way. So let us leave that process to one side. What do we need to do interim? The government, instead of looking at cash for families, allowing families to find ways of taking care of themselves. So many people have reached out to me and said, I want to send my family up country. And that's another debate at you're sending people up country to infect the older people and kill them. That's another debate. But somebody said, the safest place for my family right now is on my little plot up country, mm. and I can't afford the fare to take them there. Mm. So when people do not have the means to organize their lives and find the safest possible ways that they can live through this thing called COVID, which will be with us at least the socioeconomic ravages for the next 18 plus months. So long as the government is instead spending money uh, buying body bags, saying we have already given up, you're going to die, guys, and we're just <laughs> waiting to put your bodies in bags. in bags. Instead of the government focusing on keeping people alive, mm. they are focusing on the after effects of wide community spread and potentially people dying. Mm. But my physicians have said lots of interesting things about COVID, and they say for some reason, as Africans, we tend to be a little bit more resilient. It does not mean we are not catching it. It could have to do with our vitamin D absorption. It could have to do with a whole bunch of things. But we can only thank Providence that at this point in time, yep. unlike Melinda Gates' uh, prediction, yep. you don't have bodies littering the streets and piling high up and, and, and everyone dying left, right, and center. And we For can only hope that reason, it stays that way. Yes, and mm. most of us are asymptomatic. Yeah. Maybe we have gone through so much. We have had malaria. Mm. We've had flus. We've had. Who knows why it is that our bodies are a little bit more uh, robust when True. it comes to the virus? True. And don't forget, I'm not a medic, so I'm not stating any <laughs> medical facts here. Chero, but I'm thank you. That there are these debates. Indeed. <laughs> thank you very much, Chero yes, Tite, yes. for speaking to us, and we wish you all the best in this recovery. Now thank you're saying you you're feeling so about eighty percent. Um, I'm eighty percent there, but please. Um, uh, Eric, would you allow me just to uh, encourage all Kenyans yes. who have tested positive for COVID, do not be afraid. I came out in public, not because I like my private medical information out there, but because I believe we need to start talking about this. We need to be in the open. There should be no stigma attached to COVID. Anybody can catch COVID and I would encourage everyone mm. who is suffering, anxious, 
stressed, worried, alone in their homes. Mm. Reach out to me. You find me on Twitter. Send me a DM and say, I am stranded. I have so many people. I feel like a psychosocial counselor. I have so many people who have already reached out to me and told me their symptoms. Some people just want to talk. Wa Kenya, don't mm. hide and suffer in silence. Good. And middle class are big culprits also. They don't want to be seen to have someone in the household with COVID. In fact, the stigma lives a lot in the middle class. And I am calling Indeed. out the middle class to stop stigmatizing other people. We are the same ones who move around with impunity, who think we can afford hospital treatment. But when somebody catches it, the level of pariahdom that you're sent to is absolutely unacceptable. So I encourage Kenyans, don't hide, speak about it. Look for someone you trust. Look for me even if you don't know me. Mm. Let us be open about it. We will all catch it. Three of you there at one point or another will catch it yeah. and we cannot hide it. Mm. So I'm encouraging all Kenyans. I'm also saying pole sana to those who are still in hospital struggling to recover. I'm also saying pole sana to the families of those who have loved ones who lost their lives to COVID. Asante sana, Charity, and have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Have Joe. a good day, my friends. Take Thank care. Thank you very much. Be safe. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye.